too light or anything? Does it need to be turned down a little bit? We're okay? All right, I'm not used to all this. I'm not used to y'all seeing me, so I've got to... I got to be extra careful. Okay, let's stand. You ready, my brother? Brother, thank you. Getting excited here, and uh, well, you, you are the man. Let's lift it up. Amen. Let us read now. Are you man enough to mother others? Man enough to mother others. What's going on? Don't. Oh, you got to turn it on. Okay, let's read. Jeremiah 30, verse 3. Let's begin. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, <laughs> saith the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Dear Lord, we do pray that you'll be with the preaching and the hearing today. Give us the fullness of thy spirit. Thank you for these good folks. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In these verses, we see the end time prophecy again. There's thousands of them of Israel regathered as a nation in the last days. We're shown elsewhere. It will be first in unbelief. There'll always be a remnant. There'll be unbelief. They'll go through great tribulation and persecution and all Christians on earth that are faithful will be persecuted um, during that time. It's called Jacob's trouble here. Jacob's trouble. Uh, commonly, we call it the tribulation period. Now, it's going to be such a terrible persecution and judgments will be so terrible upon the nations of the earth that men will appear in pain as if they are in labor with a baby. Therefore, it's asked prophetically. Ask you now and see whether a man doth travail with child. In other words, he's saying, this does not happen. This has never been seen before. So what is going on? Why are they having these labor pains? So with irony, the Holy Ghost says, Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail? Since this does not normally naturally occur, what is taking place? Why do men look like they're in labor? The point is, the persecution and judgment will be so severe that men will look pregnant in labor because of their sufferings and pain. So this is a prophecy on the surface that in the last days as we get close to Jacob's trouble, the tribulation period, and certainly within the tribulation period, men are going to be in pain because of the judgments of God upon them and because of sin. Now, perhaps there's more here than people have realized in the past. Things are coming into focus in these last days, if you'll open your eyes and notice. Do men travail with child? The whole tribulation age is like a woman in labor. It gets more intense, more intense, until the second coming of the Lord Jesus in Armageddon. But we know that before a woman goes into labor, there are often pre-labor pains that grow in intensity. That's what you're in right now. You're in pre-labor pains. 
that are getting more intense and then it dies down you think everything's okay then all of a sudden you're in intensity again intensity and it's going to keep cycling till the rapture and the tribulation period begins now you just better get used to it you better get prepared well don't get used to it the idea is keep looking for the lord to come and, and get faithful get faithful get ready now but let's ask again do men travail with child do men go in labor and have babies before we look at this more literally i tell you earlier ages would have never believed what we're dealing with today in this modern techno Sodom I tell you that they just would not believe it they would not believe what we're dealing with right now if you get cold you could turn that down sisters if that gets a little cold for you just turn it off and turn it back on when everybody starts fanning okay just kind of man the air conditioner for us here um, but I want you to remember the surface point the surface point is that men will be in so much pain they'll look like they're having a baby in the last days there's already judgments now upon us and upon people and upon men. Back in 2020 of July, it says people in their 40s and 50s are in worse physical shape than people in their 60s and early 70s were at the same age. We've already seen their strength decreasing so that in many ways men have the grip strength that women did just a generation ago. But their physical strength I'm sorry, their physical shape is decreasing. It's coming down. So you're having people in their 40s and 50s being in the same health and predicament that not long ago you would see in your 60s and 70s. Uh, just the other day, uh, not long ago, really, a few months, uh, March 2021, American Journal of epidemiology says morbidity and mortality have been increasing among middle-aged and young old Americans since the turn of the century the worsening physiological and mental health profiles among younger generations imply a challenging morbidity that means suffering from disease and mortality that means dying prospect for the United States so not nobody's really noticing what's happening Nobody's noticing what's happening. But what's happening is the American diet is taking a toll and we are seeing radical changes. Uh, I mean, we're, we're seeing, talk about not renewing your youth. We're, we're talking about people being old or uh, uh, suffering from old age when they are far younger than they should be experiencing such things. Science Daily uh, talks about this study they say recent generations show a worrying decline in health compared to their parents and grandparents when they were the same age a new national study reveals poor physical health higher levels of unhealthy behaviors and more depression and anxiety the declining health trends in recent generations is a shocking finding hey man let's get in church let's get saved let's get in the book let's study the Bible and let's learn to take care of your temple that God gave you amen let's take care of this temple our church and let's take care of your temple the body the temple of the Holy Spirit and let's quit this wicked ridiculous careless unhealthy eating that's killing your children killing everybody rotting the teeth out of your mouth but nevertheless I'm not gonna go too far on that I just want you to realize something right now I want you to realize it's almost as if people are walking around it's almost as if somebody looked from an earlier generation and looked at our generation they'd be like what's happening with these people are these men having babies no they're just sick that's all they're just they're just being judged because they've got poison all over their food and they're too addicted to sugar and everything else and they're too stubborn that's all it is you're just too stubborn to be wise in all things and do all things to the glory of God now let me tell you something here it's gonna get worse and I've given you a picture of some bad health but it, it gets way worse than this ask you now and see whether a man doth travail with child do men have babies we sure have a lot of men looking and acting like women right now I mean you would think if the prophet was transported to the future and many of them were able to see things in the future or at least right now uh, I'm gonna tell you something you would look and see and says, is that a man? 
Do men have children? Do men travail in labor? What, what's with all of this? If you go to the modern church, not so much this church, praise God. Praise God. The ornaments are on the women. And, and uh, praise the Lord, you look beautiful, these women. And, and, and there's not many beautiful men here. And, and uh, I tell you what, you, you look rugged and you look like you could get some work done. And praise the Lord for that. Uh, but in the most modern churches, if you look out there, if you're a guest preacher, you're like, do I call it miss? What is it? When the preacher gets up, when the song leader, like, what is that? No, I'm serious. I'm not being smart. Is that a man or is it a girl? I don't know what it is. Go to Walmart. You understand what I'm talking about, don't you? You don't know what it is. Um, and you're not being mean. You're not being mean. So, do men have children? Uh, have babies? Do they labor in, babe, uh, uh, in pregnancy? But you know what? Not just men looking and acting like women, but even worse. Oh, there is a monstrous, abominable push to use perverted Franken science to try to make it so that men can bear babies sometime in the near future. Forget everything that you've heard on Oprah Winfrey and all this stuff about pregnant men out there. It's a lie. But I'm going to tell you something. They are working on it. They're working on how they think in a few years, uh, whether or not they'll ever succeed or to whatever degree they succeed, I don't know. But I just want you to know they're trying to make it possible. Uh, I don't know how long God's going to put up with this manipulation of his creation. I don't know how long he's going to put up with it. I don't think very long. But I want you to always remember that whatever God makes distinct, Satan is going to try to make the same because he's the author of confusion, you see? So he's going to erase distinctions. The Bible says, hold fast the form of sound words. So you have male, you have female, you have father, you have mother. What happens when you live in an age when all of these words are considered illegal? That you can go to jail for uttering, that's a hate crime. Did you call that a mother? That's a hate crime. That's what's coming. That's what's coming. Woo, I tell you, that's going to be, we're living in some perilous time. Words like mother have to go. They have to go. First, there was an early feminist hatred and despising of marriage and motherhood. So they already began to attack mother. Uh, especially if she was a biblical or traditional mother. But now there is an insane leftist gobbledygook, a trans gobbledygook, and they've launched their latest attack on the word mother. Remember Adox Huxley, I'm not recommending that book, but uh, in his Brave New World many decades ago, he knew that the word mother would one day become distasteful and uncivilized. It would be seen as something shameful. You weren't even allowed to utter it. And I tell you, he saw what was coming, and he might have been involved in helping bring it all about. But um, let, me know, let me show you Newsweek just yesterday. An online debate sparked by Missouri. We're in Missouri. Um, there are some Democrats in Missouri up there near St. Louis and all of that, you know, and keep them all up there. You know what I'm saying? But an online debate sparked by Missouri Democrat Congresswoman, Congresswoman uh-oh, that's a no-no, isn't it? Newsweek is sinning. Congresswoman Cori Bush calling women birthing people has raised. Happy birthing people day. Happy, happy thingamajig day. I don't know. Bush drew praise and criticism after she used the term birthing people to describe mothers. She says, every day, black birthing people and our babies die. Is she on our side? No, 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 no. That's not what she's talking about. Every day, black birthing people and our babies die because our doctors don't believe our pain. She's forgetting the millions of abortion of black babies and white babies and Hispanic babies. She's forgetting all of that. And she's just talking about doctor error or, or the fact that doctors aren't sensitive toward a woman's 
pain, and so maybe a mistake will happen. Um, proponents argue that the gender-neutral term is inclusive of trans people who have been disenfranchised in society. Now, understand why you're getting weird a mother now. Because there are some men who are having babies. But they're not really men. They're women who claim they are men. So they are biologically born female, but they identify as men. So they can often have children naturally since they are really ultimately female. But since they call themselves men, and since you are supposed to go along with the charade and the make-believe, you're not supposed to use the word mother in regard to them because remember, she's not a mother. That's, that's a he. Even though it's having a baby, it's, it's a he. You know it's really not a he. Even though it went on or, or Oprah Winfrey and said it was a he, it was born female. It's really a woman having a baby. It, it, it's, it's really a woman biologically pregnant. But she no longer says she's a she and identifies as a he. So you can't call it a mother. So now because of these trans, these women that are really women who want to pretend they're men but have a baby, you must call them birthing people. That is a birthing person because I don't know what you identify as. Um, wow. Can you believe this? Can you believe? I don't believe long ago they would have believed that this is happening. I believe when they took that word, ask now and see whether a man does travail with child, uh, I don't believe they would, they would even be close to realizing what we're experiencing today. Wow. So there's this push for this new inclusive language to make them feel unthreatened. So those past headlines about pregnant men and the talk shows, They've been about people born biologically as female, and the whole media is playing this game of make-believe with you. However, as I already mentioned, there are Frankenstein experiments that are frantically trying to turn a truly male body into a female one by the use of hormones, injections, surgery, drugs, and such like. I've showed and documented uh, by powerful men that they said they were going to do it. They said we will first use injections and all kinds of hormones and drugs to bring about what we want to bring about. And when that stops working, H.G. Wells, others, said we will use power and force and bloodshed. Uh, this is why the world will soon experience God's judgments just as in the age of Noah. So, while in the news there is this blatant open attempt to change the sex and that gets the most attention. Everybody's talking about, oh, you're giving them drug therapy or surgery and there's this debate whether or not children, you know, Rand Paul, everybody's talking about this is child abuse to uh, subject children to these drugs and surgery to try to change their sex. If they're born female and they're getting surgeries or born male and getting surgeries, it's a horrible thing. So what I'm telling you is that is what gets all the news. But listen to me, there is a more quiet gender transitioning that is occurring through propaganda, manipulated food supply, and environmental toxins. It might be called stealth androgenation. Just as in euthanasia, the most blatant form of euthanasia gets the headlines. You know, whatever country now is euthanizing the elderly, you know, it gets all the headlines. But Ron Panzer wrote the book, Stealth Euthanasia. There's a quiet euthanasia that is happening among the elderly, among hospices, where they are putting people to death and uh, thousands of people have, ex have experienced it. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've been on talk shows, radio shows, exposing it. Uh, so there is this open euthanasia, 
But quietly behind the scenes, there's a stealth euthanasia that nobody talks about. It doesn't get any headlines, hardly. So, in the same way, while everybody's debating about the child abuse of giving drugs and surgery to minors to try to transition them into the opposite sex, very few are awake enough to realize, just like there's a stealth euthanasia, there is a stealth gender modification that is already taking place as planned through diet, environment, and media propaganda. And oh, that a lot of those people that are upset and outraged about the fact that the boy in public school wants to take drugs to go try to become a female, which he can never become, but he can mutilate himself and, and make himself sick and, and pervert his hormones and things, and that is child abuse. But while we're getting outraged in regard to that, let's get outraged about the endocrine disruptors that are getting poured out of airplanes all over Dallas, Fort Worth and places called mosquito control when really it's endocrine disruption. What about what's in the water supply? What about what's in your food and sprayed all over your food that you're putting in your vegetables and your meat and your fruit and all this endocrine disruption? And look it up. What is the pesticide used on this thing? Go look it up. Takes you maybe all of two minutes. Endocrine disruptor, endocrine disruptor, antibiotics, endocrine disruptor. There is stealth. It's in your shampoos. It's in all of these things. And uh, you just need to realize that there are folks that are given to change, and we are not to meddle with them. It says Proverbs 24, meddle not with them that are given to change. Boy, that's really coming out in focus today. For their calamity shall rise suddenly. This change that they're trying to do, I want nothing to do with it. I want nothing to do with their chain. I want my food the way God intended it to be eaten. I want the way they've been eaten for 6,000 years. I want my food. I don't want their endocrine disrupting chemicals. I tell you what, we, we have enough job trying to be a man with all this propaganda and, and, and everybody around you trying to force you to cave in. We've got enough to deal with. Your daughters have enough to deal with, with the propaganda, and you're trying to keep them from a, a false sense of beauty. Uh, and I tell you what, we just really don't need our hormones messed up any more than they already are in this day and age. You understand that? This is serious stuff. This is serious. It was serious 20 years ago when I, I told you about it, and it's even more serious now, I tell you. But let me ask this question. The title of my message is, Are You Man Enough to Mother Others? Are you man enough to mother others? That depends upon what you mean by that. Because you mean, if you mean, are you man enough to bear a child, you're just messed up in the head. Ask you now and see whether a man doth travail with a child. <laughs> There's this new masculinity that's been creeping in. It's been storming in, as you know. Have you ever heard that saying? Are you man enough to wear pink? Man enough to wear pink. You got fellows walking around with these flowers and pink things, you know. I'm man enough to wear pink. I'm man enough. Why are you looking like that? Well, I'm man enough, you know. I'm man enough to do it. Where did that phrase come from, see? Um, are you man enough to wear a skirt? How far are you going to go? What about other feminine markers? What about feminine roles and actions? There's a mass role reversal, and it's very dangerous. And I, I want to remind you that once Satan caused this role reversal with Adam and Eve or led them to it, notice Eve had Adam sewing. You just, you can look, look at it. Look at the fall. Look at the fall, and you see Adam and Eve sitting around sewing. I tell you what, that's the result. When Satan comes around, you're going to have men that are not in their place. You're going to have a role reversal. You're going to have a mess, and uh, that's how it's always been. The word wife means the one who works at the sewing machine or distaff. I totally get that there are occupations. I totally get that, uh, that men are to help the wife and that... that the Bible speaks of a man wiping a dish. I totally understand that. I totally get that the Lord spoke of a woman sweeping the house. 
And I understand that a man can help clean. I certainly believe boys in the home should learn to clean and be respectful. I also understand that there are occupations in the Bible such as the baker of Egypt. The Lord himself had some fish broiling. He was cooking some fish after the resurrection. But here's what I'm getting at. As with Jacob in the Bible, sometimes there can be a mother's over-domination where the boy is too often in the kitchen. Boys that are too soft. That hurt Jacob. You understand that? That hurt Jacob. And there are dangers today in our confused age that may not have been as manifest in earlier ages. That's why I say right now, really, really bring out these distinctions. Do what you can to really emphasize these distinctions so we give clarity to an age, to a generation that is so confused, see. Of course boys ought to wash dishes and clean their room and make their bed and pick up their clothes and help clean and have chores. I, I totally understand that. But we have boys spending too much time playing video games and computer games. They're growing soft and I do believe that you ought to help bring your boy into manhood by letting him help you with your farm work. Let him help you with the mechanical work. Let him help you with these things and there'll be a lot of help. It won't take very long before they are a lot of help. Not just going and getting tools, but you know, wow, they can be a lot of help. I'm also for girls learning self-defense. You know, we have girls taking Kung Fu here uh, in a modest, wholesome way. Uh, but praise God for you sisters that sew and cook and clean and in general know how to beautify and adorn yourselves modestly and beautify your homes. It, wh wh wherever a feminine woman goes, she brings beauty. She brings grace and, and, and it's, a, it's a wonderful thing and praise God for it. And I say more power to you. I say just continue to run with it and... Uh, Embrace your femininity. Embrace those feminine roles. And uh, what a blessing that will be. There never has been. And it never will be manly to help erase God-ordained distinctions. And it's a good idea to be careful of traditional ones. The people behind all your fashion designs and clothes and accessories are often homosexual. They have an agenda. The reason these clothes look like that, the reason that hat looks like that, the reason all of these things, your pants look the way they do, is because you've got homosexuals with an agenda behind these companies. You've seen what happened to corporate America. You've seen what happened to these, to, to Google, to Facebook, to all of these companies, to Twitter. There is an agenda, a population control agenda. There is a unisex agenda behind these corporations. And so, you, you, you need to think about things before you embrace it. What is their agenda behind this? What are they trying to do? Why are they trying to make men and women look the same in so many ways? Wake up, folks, and understand what they're doing and stand against it. I told you about the times I walked into the western clothes stores of Texas. I could not believe the feminine shirts for men and boys. And I would go up and I would say, this was Fort Worth and some other town. And I'd walk up because it just came in like a wave. You know, it was a Hollywood agenda to go after the cowboy. I don't know if you remember this. I'm not even going to mention the wicked movies. Never saw them. Don't care about it. But Hollywood had an agenda. We're going to go after the cowboy now. And we're going to try to feminize the cowboy and make it acceptable for him to be girly. And, and then the country music songs came out, you know. And uh, it, it was just, it, it's a funded agenda. So at that time, the Western manly stores changed. And you could walk in and could not believe, is this the woman's section or is this the men's section? And the employees, you know, they would go under conviction and kind of get puffed up about things. And, well, I'd wear that. I'm man enough to wear it. Are you man enough? And I would tell them plainly. I'd say, are you man enough to wear a bow? Are you man enough to wear a dress? How far are you going to go, man? This is an agenda. This is an agenda. 
So when you hear this line, I'm man enough to wear such things, how is any of this manly to erase God-given distinctions? How is that manly? You're being brainwashed. You're being brain polluted is what's happening. It isn't manly or right in any way for a man to let his hair grow long. All those pictures of so-called Jesus, that, that's Zeus. That, 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 that came from Catholic art from the Middle Ages and from paganism. That, that, that's, not, that, that's not how Jesus looked. That's ridiculous. Uh, all these feminine adornments and things that these modern fellows have, you know, it's just, it's a sad thing. And for a man to pervert his body with some future sick science so he can somehow be a she and have a baby, wow. So my first answer to the title, are you man enough to mother others? Well, if you're taking it in this way, that they're taking it, that's a stupid question. That's a stupid question. But let's radically change some gears and look at this from another perspective. There are some things you're called to do or be in the Bible. God often uses pictures, animal pictures. When he gives you an animal picture, he doesn't want you to be that animal. When he says be wise as a serpent, God forbid we come over to your house and you're wiggling around on the ground. Like, what are you doing? I'm trying to be a serpent. I'm trying to let the serpentine spirit enter into me. The righteous are bold as a lion. I don't want to come over to your house one day and you're eating raw meat. You know, what are you doing? Bold as a lion. No, no, no. We got to have some sense, right? These are word pictures, illustrations, animal illustrations to help you in regard to whatever behavior or conduct God is illustrating for you. In the same way, there are some things that men and women are to do. But God can use some known quality of the opposite sex, just like he can with an animal, to describe it, if God can say be bold as a lion and wise as a serpent and all the other thousands of things that he says with animals, why can't he tell you to be a certain way as a man and use a female picture to paint it for you? If he wants women to stand up and be strong, I've preached many sermons where I said, women, I want you to be bold and embrace your femininity. In the, in, in the face of this wicked culture, I want you to have a manly fight to stand for God-given distinction. What am I saying? I'm saying just as a man fights, I want you to stand up and be strong and fight for what Satan is trying to steal from you. And when God uses these word pictures of the opposite sex to the pure, all things are pure. It's no more telling you to be like the opposite sex in a sinful way than God's telling you to be an animal in some satanic fashion. So let me show you what I mean. Look at Isaiah 9. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Here's some men that have overcome. They have defeated the enemy, and now they're dividing the spoil, and they're rejoicing. I tell you what, there's a lot of shouting going on. There's a lot of shouting going on. I believe this is talking to women too. When God brings blessings, you're going to joy just like men when they divide the spoil. Is this saying God wants women to be men? Of course it isn't. Come on, we got common sense, right? We understand what, what's being said here. Just as men shout when they divide the spoil, so when God gives you the blessings, you're going to do some shouting just like these men. When God says in 1 Corinthians, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, that means overcome like men, be strong. That ye is talking to everybody in Corinth, male and female. You women need to quit yourselves like men. That means you need to be strong. You need to stay in the battle. You need to not get discouraged. You say, but I'm, I feel like fainting in the face of everything out here. Well, you know what? Be strong like a man. Be strong like a man. That's a picture. 
You understand that? I'm not telling you to go join the military and be a combat fighter. You understand that? That's not what God's saying. He's saying, in this spiritual battle, women, quit yourself like men and be strong. Never do anything that God doesn't want you to do like a man, but do all the things you're supposed to do. Stand fast in the faith. Be strong in it like men who are overcoming in battle. It's an illustration. I want you to see how God uses both the man in war and the woman in labor to describe his own anger and ferocity at the second coming. Look at Isaiah 42. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now I will cry like a travailing woman. Is God androgynous? Is he like Baal? They dug up an old... An uh, artifact of Baal, and it said, Baal, are you male or female? You are both. Is God transgender God? No. No. So God's just using two different pictures. God can be like a mother hen. God can be like a shepherd. God can be like a man of war. In some ways, God can be like a travailing woman. In some ways, God says that the second coming is going to be like a thief. Does God steal? No. But he's going to come upon you like a thief. These are word pictures. These are word pictures. These are illustrations. You got the mighty man and the travailing woman. So there are some things that we as men are called to do, and whether God uses eagles or lions or some created being, or even women as your example and model, you should be able to understand that. Just as women are called to do some things, and God can use a mighty man as an example for them to be strong in what God has called women to do. God calls men to do some things. He uses feminine pictures and examples for us. So now when we go back to my question, are you man enough to mother others? That's a good thing, depending upon how you look at it. Are you man enough to be a mother in some ways to others? See, I'm hot again. I want you to look at some various characteristics of good mothers in the Bible. Let's think of how we may apply these in discipleship and in blessing others. What do mothers do? Uh, in the Bible, we see mothers hoping. Something about a mother that wants to believe the best. Sometimes uh, in crazy ways, you know what I mean? Sometimes when all the evidence is there, they're still trying to believe the best. Remember the mother of Sisera in the Bible. She had a wicked son. He was a wicked, wicked general of war fighting against Israel. And he was defeated and dead. But the Bible shows her looking out the window and uh, still trying to believe that he's going to return. You know, that's a mother's hope. It's an amazing thing. And there's a degree of hope and belief in people that we should have. We ought to expect good from our brothers. We ought to try to believe the best in charity about our brothers. And like a mother, we ought to do our best to say, I don't think he really meant that in a bad way. You know, we ought to try the best we can to put the best light upon what each of us do. Do you understand that? Are you man enough to do that? Are you man enough to, to be like a mother in that regard. What else do we see mothers doing? Good mothers. You see mothers enduring amazing things for their children. You see mothers caring. You see mothers being thoughtful. You see mothers consoling. You see mothers comforting. Isaiah 66, as one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Does this mean God is female? No. Does this mean you got to be like the United Methodists or whoever they are now that want to bring hymn books where they're singing new Bible versions that, that basically call God a she, you know, or whatever? No, that's ridiculous. This is saying that God is a comforter, and he will comfort his people. He will comfort Jerusalem uh, just like a mother comforts. There's something very comforting and encouraging about a mother, a godly mother. What you mainly see mothers doing in the Bible is bearing, bearing, bearing. Not only in the nine months of pregnancy and the final labor, but there is a sense that their travailing continues in other ways. A mother bears, a mother carries, a mother endures. 
Are you man enough as a man to mother the disciples of this church? Are you man enough to endure their spit-ups and their burps? Are you man enough to endure and bear with some of the burdens of new Christians, children, that type of thing. Let me show you. I don't know if you can get any more manly than Paul. In 1 Thessalonians 2, he says, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others. When we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, he said, being an apostle of Christ, I could have came and demanded a lot of things. I could have demanded not working and, and you know, you just do all these things to, to serve. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Paul says, in some ways, I was like a nursing mother. Paul's man enough to say that. Do you understand that? That was written in an age, at least among the Christians, where nobody got confused, even though the pagans were confused. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. Oh, these are mother words. So Paul starts out and says, I've been travailing among you. I've been laboring among you like a mother. So the title of my message, Are You Man Enough to Mother Others?, are you man enough to love children, to love new disciples and all disciples, young and old? Are you man enough to love people where you are willing, like a mother, to have that affection for them, that, 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 that care? Are you willing to bear what you need to bear to bring them along in the faith? Because I'm going to tell you, Discipling anybody and bringing a church or folks or people along in the faith, it's a lot of work and a lot of travail and a lot of people cussing you and biting you and slandering you and burping all over the place. And I tell you what, it can be a mess. And when you get out of here and start discipling people, you're going to be cussed, spit on, talked about, slandered. You're going to have some angry folks burping all over the place and I tell you, you got to change diapers. you got to deal with some things to love people and bring them to where they need to be in the faith. But Paul goes on and says in the next verse, as you know how we exhorted and we comforted and we charged every one of you as a father does his children. Oh, he didn't forget his father's side. He didn't forget to exhort them. What do mothers do in the Bible? In Isaiah it says, Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. God's like a mother, isn't he? Even to your old age I am he, and even to your whoreheads will I carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and will deliver you. We ought to be like God. We ought to carry one another and bear their burdens and help them. I don't mean that you spoil them. I don't mean that you um, put up with things that you shouldn't be putting up with. The, the way you bring the balance is there are some things you ought to push for. You know, I, I might look at a fella at, th that just got off heroin and he has to go smoke a cigarette. I'm not for smoking cigarettes and you're not going to smoke around here. But we might put up with a little bit of his growth and his transition. Do you understand that? It, it, it's not that you're putting up with sin. It's that you're trying to see where he was and understand that you're trying to move him along and keep him responsible, but you're going to have to put up with some things as you wait for him to grow and help him grow. And it's got to be done very carefully. Um, Look at this one here in Exodus. God says, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Oh, you got a frayed, you got an eaglet that's falling and it's as if 
the mother catches it and now it's consoled and comforted but that same mother pushes it out of the nest and nudges it and makes the nest uncomfortable so it will learn how to fly so so mothering is comforting and consoling and having sympathy and empathy but it's also having that balance of the father's role and even in mothers uh, having that push toward responsibility like Deborah in the Bible who mothered Israel and pushed the men to be men. Come on, you can do it. Well, only if you'll hold my hand. All right, I'll go with you, but you really need to be men and you need to man up. In other words, she mothered Israel and that's what you need to do. And praise God, are you man enough to mother others? Are you man enough to, to, to push them toward responsibility and console the feeble-minded and help people grow? In Deuteronomy, it says, as an eagle stirreth up her nest. There it is right there. That's the other side of motherhood. Fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, and beareth them on her wings. So the Lord did lead him. I believe in here, there's kind of a, at least many times, there's a knocking out of the nest before she catches them. Um, are you mothering your children? Are you mothering your children in a responsible way? Are you helping them grow? Are you helping them deal with this world and be ready for these battles that they're going to face? Are you man enough to be a good mother? As men, are we man enough to mother, to care, to have a desire that people... Remember the mother of the two disciples had such a desire that they be overcomers and she wanted them to, st to, to be on a throne uh, the sons of Zebedee to, to be at the, the right and left hand of Jesus and she said Jesus I have one thing to ask of you that my sons can reign high in the kingdom that's a mother's desire it ought to be a father's desire but you ought to mother people where you have a desire that they will be found faithful, not only be saved in eternity, but be found faithful at the coming of the Lord and get that well done, good and faithful servant. Notice, beareth them, and he did lead them. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Look at the comfort. Look at the consolation. But look at the stirring up also. Look at the putting some responsibility upon them. That's a good mother. That's a good mother. Being kind, affectionate, having a desire for their growth, but helping them grow. Not, not making them unable and incapable. Teaching them to grow. That's what you have to do with the disciples in this church and those that you meet out here in the world. You have to teach them and help them grow and have such a desire that they be found faithful at the second coming of Christ. Look at our Lord. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. There's protection there. When you get young disciples wandering around and they're about to get in trouble, be a mother hen. Go gather them together and bring them. You know, it says a lot of times in a family, when the mother passes away, many of the family gatherings cease. You know, that's true in a lot of places. They say, well, the mother was the glue that was gathering everything together. Well, we ought to start mothering some lost sheep. We ought to start mothering some souls out here that don't know they need Jesus. We ought to start mothering some folk and doing what we can to gather folks where they need to be for their protection, especially the young, especially the young. You say, well, they're wandering off. I'm not going to do anything. Well, I had a baby lamb. If it wanders off close to the woods, it's starting to get dark. you got to go gather the thing. You understand? It don't got the sense to know a coyote's about to come out and eat it for lunch. If you got a young chick, you got to gather the thing. It ain't got any sense. It'll go get squished by the door. It'll get eaten by a dog. you you, you got to do something. you got to gather them together. These children in the faith that are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, they don't have the sense yet they don't have the discernment they'll end up in a cult they'll end up 
in some false teaching. They'll end up in some big sin that'll destroy their family. You got to gather them and protect them. Are you man enough to care? That's the question. There she is. <laughs> there's her little chicks. Not a very clear picture, but there's Mama Hen. Jesus says, that's what I would have done, but you wouldn't let me. So I'm going to tell you something. When you try to mother some folks and gather them and help them, there's going to be a lot of folks who aren't going to let you. No matter what you do, they're not going to let you. They don't let God. But God wants to send you to help them. He wants to send you to roll up your sleeves and say it's going to be a messy job. How many times do people say, I don't even want to deal with that? I, I don't want to deal with that. How many times do you say that? I know, no, I know. I'm going to have to argue with it. I don't even want to deal with it. It's just going to be messy. Let the pastor do it. Hey, there's folks. That's that, I understand that. But there's folks you could reach better than me. I'll do my job, I'll help you, and you come help me when I need help. But you got to go out and get your disciples. And, and you got to look and see, God, how can I be used? Maybe it's just a smile. Maybe it's a pat on the back. Maybe it's a kind word. Maybe it's an edifying conversation. Maybe it's an admonition. Desiree News, Bethany Mandel, just the other day, says, Stop calling mothers birthing people. The abortion rights organization, NARA, is now proclaiming that it's the inclusive thing to do to refer to a woman as a birthing person. What is a mother? The parent who brings forth life, nurses the baby out of infancy, and as that baby grows, mends a skin knee, or lovingly guides them through life's vicissitudes or unpleasant changes. Mothering isn't easy. Mothering isn't for the faint of heart. It's physically, emotionally, and spiritually engaging, and sometimes, yes, draining. You ever seen a mother bring forth a child? Been in the other room? Been at a home birth and been in the other room? And maybe with your wife, you've been right there. I'm going to tell you something. There is some travail that these women go through. I tell you, you little children that have been born, what your mama went through to bring you to birth in so many ways, not just physical birth, but putting up with you as you were burping and spitting up and needing your diaper changed and she had to be with you every second. I mean, what they put up with and what they're still putting up with in many cases, see. And, and think of it also from a spiritual perspective what it takes to keep a church together. What, you know, the Lord's like, can you just be in peace? And that's a pastor's heart. You know, just, just love one another. Be in peace. And, and just, let's just get the job done. Get along. You know, that, that, that's, that, that's a pastor's heart. That's a mother's heart. That we can concentrate on what's important. Now I want you to notice something. Paul says, my little children... <laughs> of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. So he went and got them saved, and he said, you know, that was like childbirth. You got those Galatians saved, and they're now in a church? He says, yeah, you wouldn't believe. I labored and labored. I tell you what, the hours of labor were so intense, but they finally got birthed, and there's a church there now, and what a blessing. And Paul says, you know what happened? Some Judaizers came in and got them under the law again, the commandments that the Lord would not have them do, and brought them into legalism. And now i got to go back again, not get them saved again, but he's got to travail to get them out of that false doctrine. Do you have some loved ones that have got wrapped up in some messed up stuff, messed up sin, messed up worldliness? Why don't you mother them? I understand not everybody, the scorner's not going to hear it, there's only so much you can do, but you need to go after people, you need to do what you can, you need to be open, and you need to say, I'm here to try to help, and it's going to take a lot to mother, you want to grow as a church, 
You want to grow as a church? Uh, that would be good. I think the Lord would be pleased. I think if we can grow faithfully in the right way and, and do a good work here and have a lot of good folks come from other places and, and reach a lot of the locals here, I believe the Lord will be very pleased. Get folks saved. Get them discipled. Get them off their drugs and alcohol and their wicked ways of living. And, and oh, I think the Lord would be pleased. Remember what it says, a one sinner repents, that, that there's joy in heaven like you wouldn't believe. And what a blessing that is. I think that's the Lord's heart. He wants it to happen. It's going to require work, folks. You know what you're asking for? You know what you're asking for to get involved in people's lives? You can't get over here and say, well, I don't want nothing to do with that. That person made me mad. We, we got to, you got to get out here and travail in birth to bring people to the place of discipleship where they need to be. It's going to take manly endurance, church of God. Notice what he says in the last days to Timothy, preach the word. Oh, we got to do that. Be instant in season, out of season. We're out of season now. But that word instant means pressing and urgent. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Those are all the fatherly things right there. With all long suffering. Oh, now we got the motherly thing. See? See what he did to you? Paul says that I've, mother, I, I've fathered. You, 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 only, you, have all, you don't have but one father, and he's talking about himself. He's not replacing Father God. He's just saying, you might have many instructors, but you have one father. He says, I fathered you. He's not replacing Father God. He's giving you a word picture. In the same way, God is saying that you need to get out here. You need to have your fatherly role, and you need to have your motherly, motherly role. You need to be man enough to mama some people. What does that mean? It means you've got to have patience with them, folks. You've got to have long-suffering. You know, a farmer's like a mama in many ways. The Bible says he has long-suffering as he waits for that precious fruit. It calls him a husband. It calls him a husband. It says the husbandman has patience, long patience, waiting for that fruit, see. To be a husband, you need to have patience, like a farmer. But a farmer is also in many ways like a mother, waiting for fruit. Think she bears that baby, and she bears it and protects it and waits for it. Long patience, long patience, say. Long patience. She travails waiting and praying to have a child, and then she has a child, and she bears it, and then it grows up, and she has to nurse the thing, and, and all of that mother stuff that she has to do. I'm just telling you, folks, in the last days, you're going to have to rebuke some things and reprove some things, but you're going to also have to have long suffering. You're going to have to mother some people and put up with some people. Patience is illustrated as feminine. Mothers endure. Mothers travail. I don't want you to get me wrong. Somebody's going to listen to this sermon, and some young fellow's going to say, you know what, I'm going right after now. I'm going to find that drunkard or that prostitute or that whatever, and I'm going to get over there, that drug addict, and I'm going to go disciple them. By all means, give them the gospel, do something. But when you start mixing your life together, you better make sure you have help and you have some accountability, and you better make sure you're spiritual enough not to lose your faith and end up backslidden. Where There's a lot of people that are like, oh, you want to come help me? Sure, come help me. And I'll tell you what, in two days, you'll be doing what they're doing, buddy. You understand that? You said, oh, I'm just going to go help the backslider. Yeah, well, you're not strong enough to help the backslider. You understand that? I've told many people that. They said, what are you saying? I can't go do it. I've been here I don't know how long. I know, but you haven't grown, and you're not strong enough to go deal with them. And I've seen some people gone. They got lost saying that they're going to go help somebody. Look at what he says, Galatians 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, there's your backslider, ye... Now, that's plural. It didn't say one person. It said ye, which are spiritual. That means not carnal. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. I believe what God's saying here is there's people that are drowning. We need to save them. Woo, I tell you what. I was a lifeguard as a young person, and they taught you self-defense to be a lifeguard. They taught us self-defense, you know. And uh, they'll drown you. They'll drown you. You've got to go save them. 
and I had to rescue somebody uh, uh, b before, and she was scratching and going crazy, and uh, you know, it, it, it was it was crazy. It was crazy. They, they, they will have kill you because they're drowning. See, folks, when people are drowning out here spiritually and backslidden, you got to go get them, but you got to know what you're doing. You got to know what you're doing, and you got to have some accountability. So when you start drowning, somebody can put. You can't just get over here secret, have your little secret world. Say, I'm just witnessing, Daddy. I'm over here witnessing. Yeah, you're not witnessing. You're smoking pot. You're doing something else. You're, you're out here doing what they're doing. You've got to do what you can to, to keep your separation, keep your high ground, keep your godliness, but in meekness, help them and mother them. You should be growing. You say, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those, Pastor. I'm one of those. Well, if we're here five years later and you're still one of those, something's wrong. See, God says the time is that you should be teachers by now. You ought to be discipling people and bearing and burping babies and dealing with all that kind of stuff. But what it is is some people don't want to get their hands dirty. They like to play like their children and, and they, they like to stay immature so they don't have any work to do. See, no. No. Every person in the church of God is your responsibility. You know that? I'm your responsibility. Your pastor is your responsibility. I'm just trying to get you to see the picture here. See, every one of you can do something. The Bible says every joint edifies that body. Not, not just the pastor. Every joint edifies that body. Right down to Abigail, Josiah, Christy, Timmy, Brother Mike. Every joint, every little finger, every finger, everybody edified. You've got something to do, folks. Okay, I'm not going to belabor that. I just hope you get it. So we need to be growing. You need to keep on loving. We need to keep on praying and laboring in prayer. Sometimes all you can do is pray. You've done everything you could do. You've fathered, you've mothered. This. There's nothing else you could do but travail in prayer and shout out to God and weep in prayer and cry out for the souls to wake up. Sometimes that's all you can do. Oh, but if you're going to be a mother, oh, it's going to take some travail and labor. Ephesians says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, Oh my, there's a faction, a fraction, there's some schism, there's somebody. Uh, I tell you what, sister so-and-so. When Paul wrote the Philippians, here he was in a dungeon, I believe. Here he was down there about to have his head cut off. And he says, will you tell those two sisters, Sintiki and, you, and whoever they were, will, will you tell them to get along in the faith and quit their mess? He had to write that down in a dungeon. By the way, I'm hearing that there's a cat fight in that church. Will you tell them to get along and quit that nonsense? That's what happens as a mother. You know what happens in your household? What's that screaming in there? Somebody's scratching, you know? Sianism clawed up Josiah's face. I said, what in the world did you do, Sianna? Claw that boy up like that. Well, he shouldn't have been blah, 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 blah. It, you understand, right? Same in a church. Why'd you claw that person like that? Well, they shouldn't have did this. And you know, th This is... There it is. There it is, folks. We got to mama one another. Amen. Somebody's got to be the mama. Somebody's got to come along. Colossians 3, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. We got to mama one another. We got to have those feminine graces of charity and patience. Bear one another's weaknesses. You know the one thing you shouldn't bear? We got to bear with one another. I wrote a track back, oh man, I'm not even going to tell you how many years ago, but I wrote a track a long time ago called Surviving the Local Church. If you survive the local church, praise God. Because the local church is filled with people, and uh, it's going to be hard to survive. But, you know, if you can survive it, praise God. If you turn your heart and your affection toward the house of God, you'll survive it, amen? amen. You'll survive it. But one thing you ought not do, you ought to bear with one another to some degree in the right way, but you ought not bear a grudge. 
Leviticus says, Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge, any grudge, any grudge, against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. You can't bear a grudge. They just put out a big study. Uh, numerous ones are coming out where they're showing that people that bear grudges are starting to have early dementia. You know how envy rottens your bones? Grudges take away your mind, your brain. See? You want early dementia? Hold a grudge. God will take your mind clear away. God, God will put your candle out. God will blow your candle right out. God says, I don't have a grudge against you, you know. I forgave you. You forgive one another. Well, what in the world am I supposed to do then? I'm mad. I'm angry. I know, but you can't go suck your thumb and hold a grudge. Well, I'm mad. I'm mad. I'm mad at Brother Timmy. I'm mad at you. So I got to go over here and tell Nathan, Hey, I'm mad at Timmy. Oh, I'm mad. You ever get mad at him? You get mad at him sometimes? Man, I tell you what. Did I do the right thing? No, no, I didn't do the right thing. The Bible says, if thy brother, our Lord Jesus, trespass against thee, and it's something you don't want to forget, and you can't forget, and you don't think it's responsible to forget, go and tell him his fault between you and five other people in the church. Whoa, it didn't say that? Well, you're just getting some advice. I'm just telling the people about it because I just need some advice, you know. Look at it now. Tell him between thee and him alone, between him alone, and if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, now you can cuss him out and hold a grudge. Hey, I went to him and I told him I'm mad. I'm spitting mad. I'm angry. I'm really not angry at you. You're a good kid. But I've already went and told him I'm mad. Do you take my tools and throw them out in the woods? Do you just get my monkey wrenches and all those things and see how far you can throw them in the woods? I don't think you do at all. You don't think you do? But listen, if you've gone and told your brother, and he says, no, you're not looking at it the right way, buddy. You ought to be apologizing to me. Hmm, okay. Now we got a big problem, don't we? Now I go gossip and slander and hold a grudge and hate him. Is that right? No. See, our Lord's, he's your Lord. He made you. He knows, how to, he knows how to make this thing work. So he says, if he will not hear thee, and you still think it's important and responsible to do it, then take with thee one or two more. That doesn't mean go to Nathan and say, Nathan, I'm so mad at Timmy. You wouldn't believe what he did. Can I tell you my side of it? Three hours later, whoo, I feel so much better now, man. Oh, I done unloaded on old Tim. No, no. I go to Nathan. I say, Nathan, I got to deal with Brother Timmy here. I'm not even going to tell you what the issue is, but I need you to come with me and just be a witness. I'm not here to try to persuade you. Maybe I'm not thinking right. But will you come be a witness? Our goal is peace between me and him. Will you come with me and be my witness? And I need another one. I need, I, I need another one. It said, uh, take with thee one or two more. Sometimes that means you might need another. Sometimes. Depending upon the situation, you can discern it. But if he neglect to hear them, and the two witnesses say, man, I saw this brother try to get this thing straight, and he's got a serious matter here. And I tell you what, that brother's puffed up, and he's upset about this thing, and man, he, he, he's got a spirit of a, he's got a grudge on him, man. Okay. This is a church issue now. This is a church issue. We're going to have to appoint a council. 
or we're going to have to have men's meeting or have a whole church meeting, depending on what's going on here. We're going to have to have a meeting. But our goal is to work this thing out. Our goal is that these two folks get together and uh, we're, we're going to mother one another and we're, we're going to do what we can and we're going to endeavor. We're going to pray and be long-suffering and charitable and loving and forgiving and we're going to try to work this thing out and bring repentance where need be. But if we as a church appoint that council and that council says this brother is still being nasty and he won't do anything, he won't give the money back, he won't do this, he won't say he's sorry, well, if he doesn't hear God's church, if he won't hear God's institution, the Bible says, whatsoever you bind and whatsoever you loose in that local church, the same is ratified in heaven. It doesn't mean a church is always going to be right, but oh, you better, you better tremble before you go against. See, because this thing's done sifted through. You're likely in the wrong, see. So what you're going to do now is if he will not hear that council, that church, you're to treat him as a heathen. And you're to say, Brother Chris, you're not, you're not going to attend here and be in fellowship here. But because you're just too rebellious. You've got a grudge on you. You're just going to have to go deal with it. And, and, and deal with some hard knocks from Satan. Now he's going to cuss you and cuss the church and say he's been mistreated and all that kind of stuff. And there are some bad churches out there. and There are some bad pastors and some bad people. Don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to give you the Lord's way to try to keep our unity together, okay? Are you getting it? Are you understanding? Okay. Uh, I'll give you my last verse for you. Proverbs 11. Amen that it's the last verse? Or... That's all right, brother. Proverbs 11.30. <laughs> the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. What did he say? Thou hast gained thy brother. Isn't that what we're, what we're about here? We're trying to gain each other. We're trying to gain each other for the Lord. Trying to gain each other for the Lord's kingdom. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this church. We thank you, Father, for mothers. We thank you for fathers. We thank you for brothers. We thank you for sisters, Lord. We thank you for the dear children. And we do pray, God, that we can grow up in the faith and mother one another and father one another and be long-suffering with one another to hold each other accountable in love as a father does to charge one another when needed and exhort one another but Lord let us be dear and affectionate toward one another let us really have a heart that weeps for one another let us weep when there's a schism or a division between us and another Lord for the devil, oh God, how easy he can bring just quarrels and schisms and troubles. He comes to divide, Lord. He comes to divide between husband and wife and that type of thing. He's a sower of discord. God, if there's a division, let it be for your truth. And we know that you divide in righteousness for righteousness' sake. But in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray there'll be some folks that'll man up, get busy, roll up their sleeves, and be willing to endure in long-suffering so some disciples can grow up in the faith. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.